Experts say New Zealand real estate prices are expected to crash. I'm going to tell you what's happening and what you can do about it. Here's the headline from The Guardian, hardly our favorite newspaper here at Nomad Capitalist. The headline, New Zealand banks predict 20% drop in house prices over the next year. Economists say tighter credit conditions, higher mortgage rates, and increased housing supply is behind sinking prices. I'm going to tell you all about it. If it's your first time here, my name is Andrew Henderson. I'm the founder of Nomad Capitalist. We're a boutique consultancy that helps seven and eight figure entrepreneurs and investors legally go where you're treated best. That means lower taxes, more diversified assets, uh, second passport, just more freedom in general. And we also host the biggest and best offshore conference called Nomad Capitalist Live, which is open to absolutely everyone. And so I'm going to share this article from The Guardian and uh, opine as we go, because as someone who has invested around the world, uh, my personal opinion, not giving you investment advice, but my personal opinion is, yeah, you've done pretty well investing in property in Australia, uh, investing in New Zealand, uh, investing in Canada. You are seeing more Western countries attack capitalism in the sense of saying, we don't want foreign investors, for example. And even people who claim to be capitalists cheer that on, by the way, saying, well, yeah, our housing is too expensive. We had to do something for the people. There's a lot of things happening in the Western world that while you've done well in the past, doesn't mean you'll continue to do well in the future. I continue to believe that you have uh, some combination of uh, investment in developed countries and in up and coming countries. It's what I do and I've been pretty successful with it. Uh, if I'm owning a bunch of property in New Zealand, I'm going to want to diversify some of that out while we are at what some could argue is a peak and that's what they're saying here. Here's the article. New Zealand's house prices are on track to drop by up to 20% in the next year, the biggest drop since the 1970s, half a century. Two of the biggest banks have predicted, which would take prices back to where they were just over a year ago. For years, the country's been plagued by a runaway housing market. Imagine that. How, what a plague. The cities of Wellington and Auckland have some of the least affordable property markets in the world, and homeownership rates have been falling since the early 1990s across all age brackets, but especially people in their 20s and 30s. Now, no doubt, people should have the opportunity to buy a home. Here's what's been happening, here's, here's my take on it, is we've talked, and I've been talking about this around the dinner table for a quarter of a century, the fact that Western markets are going to have to increasingly be competitive with other countries as other countries open up. We've talked, and I've mentioned this before, the former Trump advisor, Steve Bannon, bemoaned, we uh, built a middle class in Asia and we hollowed out the middle class in the United States. The Western world has existed in many ways based on ensuring that no other country outside of the West, outside of what they call the international community, had a middle class at all. And now that everywhere from Malaysia to Vietnam to Colombia to Mexico to countries in Africa to countries in Southeastern Europe are building middle classes, are attracting jobs, are becoming more attractive places even to move, let alone invest and do business, the Western world is having trouble keeping up. Those people have wanted to, let's say wealthy Chinese, for example, buy property in countries like New Zealand. New Zealand responded by saying, hey, we don't want that, right? And so it's becoming a test for these countries. Do we want to be free markets or do we want to not be? But what they don't want to be free markets in for sure is they don't want to be competitive to the fact that New Zealand is no longer the best place for many people to be hiring, to be starting a business. We talk to folks from Australia and New Zealand and all over the world all the time, and they're like, why would I start a business here and pay these incredible wages? It's gonna take me a lot uh, more time to, to grow my business. It's gonna be a lot harder for me to be competitive, all because New Zealand or whatever country I'm in does not wanna be competitive. And then they see, yeah, wages are stagnant. Why is that? The world economy is growing, it's just that wages in New Zealand aren't growing. And I'm sure the politicians there, just as where I'm from in the United States, wanna blame it on greedy capitalists, but you know what? It is human nature to go where you're treated best, and that's why you're seeing these housing numbers data. That's why you're gonna see more people protesting and electing left-wing politicians who wanna take more of your money. It's not fair, they say. Now, New Zealand is in the midst of some of the largest drops in slowdown since the aftermath of the global financial crisis, The Guardian says. The number of houses sold in April was down 30% from the month prior, according to the Real Estate Institute. And according to Westpac, prices fell by 1.1% in April, now down 5% from their peaks in November. Price drops and supply increases will be welcome news for prospective buyers, but recent first-time home buyers who spent a large amount of money to own an asset that has fallen in value could face challenges to keep up with mortgage payments amid increasing interest rates and a cost of living crisis. Exactly why I play conservative and I don't use debt. Now, obviously it's very difficult for many 20 and 30 year olds to simply not use debt and buy property in, us, in New Zealand or in Australia. 
But when you move to the emerging markets and you lower your tax rates, you can own a house and you can pay cash and not to worry about rising rates and, and adjustable rate loans. And uh, I bet a lot of people could do that and could live. I mean, you could buy a house for $50,000 in a lot of countries. And I bet if you lived there and you saved up some money, even from a remote job or a small business, you could do that. It'd be a lot more economically secure, but everyone wants to stay in New Zealand and uh, live in Jacinda's paradise. Uh, however, the bulk of the house price impact from the mortgage rate surges yet to come. About 60% of all mor mortgage rates will be reset. Ah, yes, the adjustable rate mortgage over the coming 12 months, ASB said. Uh, that's one of the country's two largest banks. They talk about the three big housing nasties as the reason behind the receding prices. Tighter credit conditions, higher mortgage rates, and increased supply of new housing. Which, by the way, in a lot of countries, housing is so unaffordable, in the West at least, because the governments, the busybody governments, won't let people build new housing. And then they blame people like you and people like me for driving up the prices. They blame us for investing. They blame us for not paying people enough. But in reality, is they won't build more housing supply for a growing population. Interest rates could nearly double for some households, uh, ASB economists said, but it does not expect the change to lead to the widespread mortgage distress or forced sales. But the rate shock will siphon a bunch of extra disposable income out of Kiwi's wallets this year, hitting discretionary retail spending hard. What I always come back to, and I said this going back to when I was much younger when the Iraq war started and people said, well, I, I recall like what's going to happen to gas prices? Could gas prices go up? And people were like, well, you know, I said, listen, if uh, things get bad enough, people won't care what happens to the Iraqis. They'll say, give me my cheap gas. People are used to their low rates. They're used to their cheap fuel. They're used to everything they would at cheap goods at Walmart or whatever the store is. And uh, when that stuff doesn't happen, they get angry. Their Western way of life, which is simply not sustainable in a globally competitive economy, at least for the average person, they're going to be angry and they want to keep it. And by the way, who wouldn't? So you're going to have politicians who, again, are going to say, well, why don't we just take money from this evil rich guy over here because he's running a business that's making too much profit, something you've heard in the last two years. They're talking about it even now in relatively tax friendly and, and kind of anti-tax increase countries like Hungary and Europe. They, they want a windfall profits tax, and they've imposed it in some cases on, on things like airlines, and now they want to do it more. And so you're going to see more countries coming out with windfall profits taxes. You make too much money. We want a wealth tax. That was certainly uh, on the menu at one point in New Zealand. New Zealand is not the most taxed country in the West, certainly, but they are trending in that direction. And now with uh, more leftist leaders in Australia, it seems that they are cozying up and uh, working on new leftist progressive policies to put in place. And so the fact that, as The Guardian says, the ferocity of the rise in house prices during what turned out to be a period of super low interest rates, that's probably going to come back and affect you as people become increasingly uh, you know, scared and, and frustrated. And you know what? They're not wrong to be scared and frustrated. And when, when people hear me saying they want to come after you, I'm not against these people, but I think that their anger is misplaced. Because their anger has been channeled with the, where the politicians have, have taken advantage of these last couple, in the last number of years to say, oh, it's the greedy capitalists. Look at in the United States where they said, uh, you know, Joe Biden and all the people in the Treasury, everyone's coming out and saying uh, inflation is because of greedy capitalists. That's not the case. Inflation is because the government and their cronies have done a terrible job managing what they're supposed to be managing. They've just done a terrible job. And so you're going to see a lot of people who don't really pay attention, don't really understand. They're not bad people, uh, but they don't really pay attention to what's going on. They don't understand perhaps macroeconomics. They're just, they're just doing their thing. They're living their life. And they've been expecting, based on generations, the fact that they would just have a nice, easy life. And if that comes at the expense of you know, people in Serbia or we hire having a miserable life, hey, who cares? Well, guess what? I don't need to hire in New Zealand. I can hire in Serbia. And that has driven up wages in Serbia. We see it every year. It goes up. Wages in New Zealand, perhaps like the United States, relatively stagnant. And now you're seeing these other factors come in where people are going to start to get hit and they're going to want to come after your wallet. So again, I'm not here to give you investment advice, but if I'm in these markets where you've seen these huge price run-ups, to me, that can't go on forever. Now, I'm a security-minded, rather conservative person. I don't think, I'm not always trying to press my luck. But for me, the idea of this kind of ebb and flow, the idea that this stuff was built on cheap money, I'd rather go and put my money in a market that wasn't built on cheap money. We've talked here, whether it's in Latin America, whether it's in Southeast Asia, other parts of the world, there are places where like 10 or 20% of people have mortgages. Do you think those are more stable housing markets? Look at a market, we've always talked about Cambodia. They had 
uh, typically recession in 2020, as did every country in the world. But generally for 30 years, there has been no recession. Now, Australia and New Zealand have done pretty well, no doubt. Is that going to continue forever, especially as they continue to tighten down and say, no, we don't want foreign investment. No, we're going to put this policy in place. We're going to put this policy in place. We're going to raise interest rates. Is that going to lead to being the best place for your capital? I'm not saying to sell everything you have in New Zealand, Australia, or anywhere else. What I am saying is, again, not my investment advice, but just if I were you, I like being diversified. And when I talk to folks who are from these countries and they have six rental properties, hey, you know what? Again, not going to give you advice, but what if you sold one or two? How would that feel? And what if you deploy that capital somewhere else, whether it's in other real estate in other countries, maybe that gets you a residence or citizenship, you kill two birds with one stone, maybe you get a brokerage account somewhere. There are lots of opportunities to diversify and at least take some money off the table so that you're no longer a slave to one country or the economy of one country. We've seen how that's worked for Australians who couldn't get into their country or out of their country for some time recently. We've seen how that's worked for Canadians who had their bank accounts frozen. And certainly these things did not happen to everybody, but the idea of being diversified to me seems increasingly important. And on top of that, banks predicting a 20% drop, that seems to me a great reason to want to move some capital around.